Thank you for tuning in today. I pray that today's message will empower you to use your voice, help change the way you think, and refresh your spirit. If you'd like to follow along with Pastor's Notes, you can find them on our app. We're continuing in our series, From Stressed to Blessed. Last week, we learned we're to pass through our valleys, and to do that, we have to know our authority in Christ. Today, we're learning to stand up, stand against adversity, stand on the Word of God, Stand up to the devil and he will flee from you. Let's go. Today I want to continue a series of messages that we're doing out of a few verses in Psalms 84. And uh, we're simply calling this series the Valley of Baca. By the way, the Baca means weeping. So starting with the fourth verse, it says, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, the valley of weeping. Now, I want you to notice what it says as you pass through. You're not supposed to live there. Some people take what what should be maybe a chapter in the book of their life, and they make it the whole book. It's not you're supposed to pass through. David said, yea, though I pass through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. It says... As they pass through the valley of Baca, of weeping, they make it a spring. Now, notice it's not something that God does. It's something you do. It's something you do with the authority that God has given you. So often we just sit back and, well, whatever God wants to happen is going to happen. Look, okay, Sarah, Sarah. Now, the Bible says you make it a spring, right? So it depends on what you do. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. Again, this is going to be someplace we're passing through. Job said this in in Job 5 and verse 7. It says, yet man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. How many of you have noticed there's some opposition? There's, There's some trouble. So, I, I did not know they were going to uh, use the song in worship that they did this morning. But there is a song, th- song that was taken from Matthew chapter 7, which is really one of our main scriptures this morning. It says this in the 24th verse. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, the rock, notice, is what Jesus said. It's the word of God. You build your house or your life on the rock, the word. The rains descend, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on that house, and it didn't fall, for it was founded on the rock. And what's the rock? The word. You're living your life based on the word of God. Now, you may have been told, I've heard people say this, well, if you'll come to Jesus, You'll, know, you'll never have any more trouble. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> Jesus said, if you come to him, there are going to be rains, there's going to be floods, there's going to be winds that are going to beat against the house of your life. Jesus did not say, come to me and you will have no trouble. He said, come to me and you will get through the trouble. Right? He said, you'll make it. Your house, your life is going to stand. When the storm is past, you're still going to be there. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew, they beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So Jesus said, whether you hear the word and do it or hear the word and don't do it, there's going to be floods, there's going to be winds, there's going to be storms. The Bible says in Proverbs 24 and verse 10, it says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength or your faith is small. You you may have gone through life and at this point in your life, you just feel like you're just cruising through. I, I want you to understand that at some point, there's going to be a day of adversity. It may be a physical situation. It may be a financial situation. It may be a relationship situation in your marriage. It might be with your kids. Sometime, someday, some way, 
There is going to be a day of adversity. You're not going to slip through life on a flowery bed of ease without any opposition. First of all, realize the Bible says this, 1 Peter 5, verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Right? Now, notice he can't devour just anybody. He's seeking whom he may devour. But he's going to come and he's going to try. Now, he, he, he really devours because he's seeking. He devours ignorant people and people who open the door and participate with him. But when you open the door, you're opening the door for him to come in and attack. But the day of adversity is going to come. Um, I, I've told this story before, but I wanted to hear it myself, so I thought I'd tell it again. Now, about 30 years ago, I, I took my son Samuel, who at that time I think was 11 years old, and my son Daniel sitting here in the front row. I think you were nine years old. But we went up to Ludington to go salmon fishing. And we get in the boat with the captain, and we go out seven, eight miles north of Ludington, what they call the point. And uh, we're fishing out there for several hours, fishing for salmon. And finally, the, the captain said, you know, time to go back. And so we bring in the, the, the poles, and, and we're cruising across Lake Michigan, probably about 25 miles an hour. Boom, 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 boom. There's about three-foot rollers out there. And we're boom, 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 coming across. Everything's just fine. And all of a sudden, the motor starts going, you know. And that boat starts jerking. Well, the captain, he puts that boat in neutral. He turns the motor off. And, and it's got the motor in the middle. And he lifts up the motor cover. And there is water. I mean, it just starts coming. We didn't realize it. We had hit a log. And we had a hole in the bottom of the boat about this big. And the water is just pouring in. So he goes back. He tries to start that motor. But that motor is now in the water. In fact, we're starting to stand in water. And he grabs his radio, and he said, Mayday! Mayday! Coast Guard! Mayday! Mayday! And the Coast Guard responds. He says, Coast Guard, how can we help you? you know? and, and he says, we're sinking! And the Coast Guard says, where are you? You know, he's got this big old fancy electronic Lowrance up there. And so he gives them all the numbers on the Lowrance. They know within probably 50 yards, for sure, 100 yards of where we are. And then they say, uh, we're dispatching a boat right now. We'll be there in 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, you know what? We are, the water's about up to here now. We've got maybe two, two and a half minutes. And that boat is going down. And the, the, the captain, he looks at me. And, and I, terror. I mean, there is absolute terror in his face. And he said to me, he said, I can't swim. <laughs> right. um, and I thought, because back then I was doing a lot of triathlons, I was competing and swimming, and I thought, well, I could teach you. <laughs> and then I thought, but not in two minutes. <laughs> okay. Now listen, here's what a lot of Christians do. They wait until their boat of their life has got a hole. They're sinking. The doctor said, you have cancer. You have two months to live. And then they're like, the Bible says something somewhere. Doesn't the Bible says healer Jesus or something? You know, that is not the time to find your Bible. You don't prepare for the day of adversity in the day of adversity. You prepare for the day of adversity before the day of adversity. You learn to swim Years before, there's a hole in the boat. So I said to him, I said, uh, have your life jacket. Said, yeah, yeah. You know, I put one on each of the boys. Again, I, I think Daniel's nine, Samuel's 11. We're about two miles from shore. And I put those life jackets on them, and I literally, I picked each of them up, and I threw them in. And I said, swim that way. <laughs> now, the water's probably 55, 57. It was, a cold, it was cold water. And you say, why did you do that? Well, I'd seen the same movie you did where the boat went down and there was that, that vortex thing. You know, I'm like, I don't want my kids getting sucked down. You know? <laughs> so, so I turned to the captain, you know, by this time, um, he's got his life jacket on. And uh, I, I, I get in with the boys and, and the boat went down. 
Um, fortunately, there was a, a boat that was about a half a mile away that saw us go down. And they came and, and they rescued the captain. Uh, the Coast Guard got there, rescued Daniel, Samuel, and myself. Uh, we were all fine, except Daniel had hypothermia. And so we put him in the shower for about 15 minutes. And then we all had a steak dinner. <laughs> It turned out great. But I'm just telling you, when the day of adversity comes, you've got to be ready for the day of adversity. You don't wait until your boat of your life is sinking and then say, what, what do I need to do? You prepare ahead of time. So what Jesus did, by the way, um, Jesus, it, it's very interesting how little Jesus talked about heaven. Now, he talked about heaven. But how little he talked about heaven. Because Jesus' message was, change the way you think. The kingdom of God is here. Not the king, not you're going to go to the kingdom, all right? But the kingdom is where? Here. It's now. It's available. It's for you. Jesus said to his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. Not people that are just on their way to heaven, but go and make disciples disciples. So I wanted to take a few minutes this morning and talk to you about going through the valley of weeping. Now, sometimes we get in that place. We get in that place because who we have in the boat of our life. And I would like to use an example, Jonah. Uh, For those of you who don't know the story, God comes to Jonah and says to Jonah, go to to Nineveh, that great city, arise and go and preach in that city. Well, Jonah hates the Ninevites. They are the enemies of the Israelites. And and you read the whole story. He literally wants God to send fire from heaven and cook them. He's like, burn them up. Make them crispy. And that's where he's at. And so he doesn't want to go to Nineveh. He doesn't want God to be merciful to the Ninevites. And so instead of heading to Nineveh, he gets in a boat going the exact opposite direction, and he is running away from God. Now, the Bible says he paid his fare. He went down into the boat, right? And then he went down to the lower parts of the boat, and then he laid down. Uh, by the way, when you're running from God, it's pretty much down, 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 down. But then the Lord sent, the Bible says, a wind on the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. And the sailors are like, well, what has caused this? And they cast lots, and it falls on Jonah. And they say, why is this happening? He said, because I'm running from God. And they say, well, what do we need to do? And he says, throw me overboard. And they work really hard against the storm, but to no avail. So finally, they throw Jonah overboard. How many of you know the story? Instantly, the storm ceases. And God has prepared a huge fish, and it swallows Jonah up. And uh, he swims around in that fish for a while, and that fish vomits him back up. But here's what I want you to catch. There can be storms in your life, not because of you, but because you have Jonah in your boat. You got somebody in your boat. You got somebody in your life. You're trying to help them. these, these, These sailors, they're trying to get through the storm. And you know what? Jonah's doing? He's down on the bottom of the boat sleeping. He's not, he doesn't care, but the sailors are caring. They're trying to deliver them, but he doesn't really care. And you can have people in your life that you are trying to help, but they don't really want help. You can have people in your life that because of your association with them, you're in trouble. Proverbs 13, verse 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise. But the companion of fools, you don't need to be a fool. You just need to hang around with them. The companion of fools will be destroyed, will be destroyed. And sometimes we have people in our life, we are trying to help, but they don't want help. So Jesus tells this story. He said there was a certain man, he's going from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he falls among thieves. They beat him up, they leave him for dead, take all his stuff. And by chance, Jesus said, along comes a Levite, Christian guy. And he sees him and he passes by on the other side. And then along comes a priest. 
a pastor, and he passes by. But then he said, along comes a Samaritan. Now, understand this. The Samaritans and the Jews, they hated each other. There was a tremendous prejudice both ways. A Jew would not even talk to a Samaritan. When Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman, she says, how is it that you, a Jew, are even talking to me? But that Samaritan sees him. He said, the Bible says he had compassion. He felt something. He felt drawn. He got down. He took care of him. He, he bandaged up his wounds. He put him on his own donkey. He took him down to the hotel. He took care of him that night. Next morning, he got up, went to the innkeeper, gave him a couple hundred bucks and said, take care of this guy. And if you spend any more when I come back, I'll repay you. I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, the man helped somebody that was in his way. He encountered that man. But when he did, he felt compassion. He felt compassion. Have you noticed reading the Gospels that it'll say that Jesus was moved with compassion? He was moved with compassion. In, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about all the gifts of the Spirit. And then it says this, but I show you a more excellent way. And you know what it begins to talk about? Love or compassion. Compassion. You know, when God's calling you to do something, you feel drawn in that direction. The Bible says this in Philippians chapter 3. I believe it's verse 13. It says, God himself is at work in you inspiring you to want what pleases him and to work for them. So God puts desires on the inside of your heart. And how does that happen so often? It's by compassion. You see the situation, you feel drawn. Next thing is this guy had what that man needed. He had stuff to take care of him. It says he poured in the oil and the wine and he bandaged him up. He had the stuff he needed. And then most importantly, all right. The man received it. The man received it. He didn't say, get away from me, you dirty Jew or dirty Samaritan. No, he didn't say that. He received the help. And when it's somebody you're supposed to help, they receive the help. They want to change. They want to grow. They want to be delivered. But if you're wasting your, you're, you are wasting your time when you have somebody who does not want help, who does not want change, who does not want to be delivered, and you're trying to pour yourself into them. If they're the person God has for you to minister to, they will receive what you have, and you have what they need, and you're moved on the inside. You are moved with compassion. Then there's other times that we end up in trouble. Um, we end up in trouble because we make bad choices. Let me give you a verse here. This is Proverbs 19, verse 3. We are ruined by our own stupidity. Got that? We are ruined by our own stupidity, though we blame the Lord. And how often haven't we seen that? Somebody does dumb stuff, and then they say, why did God do this to me? God didn't do this to you. You did it to yourself. I, I remember years ago, uh, a woman coming and talking with us, and, and, and she was just getting engaged to a non-Christian. Right? Now, the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. But she's a Christian. He's not a Christian. And we said, no, you should not marry him. You know, the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked together. No missionary dating. And she says, yeah, but he said, if I marry him, he'll come to church. And if I marry him, he'll stop drinking. And if I marry him, he'll stop smoking. We said, no, you, you should not marry him. The Bible says, don't do that. And, and she says, yeah, but I, I love him. Six weeks later, right, with black and blue eyes where she had been beaten by him, she came. This, this is what she said. She said, why did God do this to me? God didn't do that to you. Stupid did that to you. Hello? You see, listen, it is very possible to have Jesus in your heart and to have, I would say it this way, and not have the wisdom of Jesus 
in your mind. I know that's blunt, but it's true. You can be saved and have Jesus in your heart, but you're living like the world. Second, second, Romans 12, verse 2, says to be transformed by changing the way that you think. We, we need to accept what God says and say, God, you're right. You're right about marriage. You're right about forgiveness. You're, you're right about forgiving. And you're right that you haven't given me a spirit of fear. We need to recognize God is right. If you get in your car and drive down 28th Street, 50 miles an hour, and pay no attention to the lights, and you get in a wreck, God did not do that to you. Stupid did that to you. Right? So the Bible says the stupidity of a person turns his life upside down. Same verse, uh, different translation. The stupidity of a person turns his life upside down and his heart rages against the Lord. And then we're mad at God. Why did you do this to me? Right? But we were not walking in the wisdom of God. Jesus said, if you hear his word and do his word, right? the storm's going to come, the wind's going to come, the flood's going to come, but you're going to come through. And your life is going to be standing on the, other, on the other end. But he said, if you hear that word and you don't do it, he said, the storms of life can take you down. They can take you down. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, people say to me, well, what about Job? Uh, there's a book in the Bible. Some of you haven't read it. Uh, maybe you haven't read it because it's the book of Job, but you thought it was the book of Job. <laughs> You're staying away from that job, that boat, you know. But it's the book of Job. And Job, by the way, the Bible says Satan went out and smote Job with sore boils from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Satan is attacking him. He attacked his finances. He attacked him physically. He attacked his family. And people say, well, I'm just Job. Now listen, all, all Bible scholars agree on this. The book of Job took a maximum of nine months and probably only three months. So someplace between three and nine months, Job went through a trial. And then you know what happened? The Bible says God turned the captivity of Job. He turned his captivity. He got healed. He got blessed and ended up with twice as much as he had before. Now, listen, if you want to be Job, go get healed, go get blessed, and go get delivered. But don't stay there forever. Because you're supposed to pass through the valley of the shadow of death. You're supposed to make the valley of weeping a spring. And again, it's not just what God does, it's what we do. Um, when, I, when I was first saved in the early 70s, um, there was a, a rather popular book called Run, Baby, Run. Nikki Crew's story. How many of you, anybody remember that? Anybody read? Oh, yeah. There's several hundred people that have read the book. Okay. So he was born in Puerto Rico. And when he's three years old, his mother declares him to be the son of Satan. And, and he is literally dedicated to the devil as a three-year-old child. Uh, he grew up very poor, very disadvantaged. At the age of 15, he, along with six of his brothers, moved to New York, where he became the leader of one of the most notorious, most notorious violent, feared street gangs in New York, fighting, stealing, drugs, all of it was part of his life every day. In one of those fights, his, his best friend was stabbed and died in his arms. Uh, one night, a minister invited him to come to a service. David Wilkerson, by the way, invited him to come to a church service. And he actually threatened to kill David Wilkerson when he invited him, but he ended up going. And in that service, God touched his life. Uh, he gave his life to Christ. And instantly, he said, chains were broken. He said, I felt clean. For the first time in my life, I felt like I had purpose and destiny. And he said, and I knew I was no longer the son of Satan. It, I want you to know that God's salvation is bigger than any addiction, any negative words that were spoken over you, how you were raised, the, the, the abuses that you suffered, then sickness, then challenges. God's salvation is bigger. And listen, you, you cannot be defeated by the devil or by people or by circumstances or the cycle of defeat and dysfunction and depression and poverty because what God did in Christ 
is greater than anything that the devil can do in your life or anybody else's life. The psalmist said, I will call on the Lord who's worthy to be praised. And so I will be saved from my enemies. He said, the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and are safe. He says, the righteous may fall seven times. Well, you say, I fell 770 times. Seven is not the number. It is a number that represents infinity. It's just saying, it doesn't matter how many times you fall. You just keep getting back up. No matter what kind of opposition the devil throws at you. The apostle Paul mentions a few things that happened to him. He said, five times I received 39 stripes from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods where they would take off your sandals and beat the bottom of your feet with rods until they broke bones three times. He said, three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I spent in the deep. Once he was stoned and left for dead. He had 40 men take a vow to kill him and not eat until they'd killed him. I've had people mad at me, but none that were taking vows to kill me. How about you? I mean, he had some problems. In one occasion, we look at him. Uh, He's in prison. He's sent to Rome on a ship. There's a hurricane. And for two weeks, they did not see the sun or the moon. The ship is broken up. There's a shipwreck. He swims to shore. He gets bitten by a poisonous snake on his arm, right? Which he, of course, he just shakes off. Listen, he didn't make anything of it. Most Christians I know, if the washing machine and the lawnmower are broke in the same month, they think it's the great tribulation. And they're like, God, why have you forsaken me? (laughs) All right. But here's what Paul said. He said, therefore, we do not lose heart. We do not get discouraged. Even though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, that trouble you got, light affliction, in prison, beaten, but with rods, whipped, stoned, and left for dead, our light affliction which is but for a moment, is working in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Well, we do not look at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, subject to change, but the things that are not seen, they are eternal. Now, you say, well, it sounds like you're saying we're just going to go through on a flowery bed of ease. Not at all. Not at all. There is an enemy. There is the devil. He hates you. Jesus said he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. You say, why does he hate me? Because he hates God and he can't hurt God. But what he can do is he tries to hurt those that God loves. Right? That's why he's there. So Jesus said, listen, the kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violent take it or seize it by force. Right? Another translation says it this way. And the violent push their way in. In other words, everything God wants for you is not just going to happen. You're going to have to take it. Not from God, because God, Jesus, what Jesus said, your father desires to give you the kingdom. But then he said the kingdom suffers violence, and the violent take it. The violent force their way in. You're not taking it from God. You're taking it from the devil who's trying to keep God's blessing from you. Now, let me, let me f- finish with another thought here. Um, and this is in first Peter chapter two. Um, I've never seen these verses on anybody's refrigerator. You say, what does that mean? They say, these are verses nobody likes. All right. But how many, you know, all the verses are true. So here we go for this is commendable. It because of conscience towards God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you're beaten for your fault, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called. All right. So as a believer, one of the calls on our life is to do righteousness, to do the right thing, and to be rejected and to suffer for it. That's the call on our life. 
People say, oh, why, why is this happening to me? It may be because you're doing something right. You know, if you never have any problems with the devil, you're probably going in the same direction. Hello? In fact, Jesus, well, it, 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 it's a, to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an example that we should follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Listen, as a believer, I want you to listen. You're called to suffer for doing the right thing. You're called to suffer, the Bible says, for his name's sake for righteousness sake and for the kingdom's sake. In fact, this is what Jesus said. He said that when you suffer for righteousness sake, he said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For so persecuted they the prophets who were before you and great is your reward in heaven. Now, I remember one time we were going through a really tough time in Mexico. Uh, I, people had spit in my face. They slit the tires on our car. They'd done all sorts of different things. And I remember when Jesus gave me that verse. And I kind of went, oh. It, I was not impressed. All right? I was not impressed. But the truth is, as believers, we are called to suffer for righteousness' sake, for the kingdom's sake, for his name's sake. In the last hundred years, more Christians have been martyred for their faith than in the previous 1900 years. Martyred for their faith. How I many you know, we've pretty much gone unscathed here in America. Although things are starting to change. Quite fast, in fact, things are changing. You say, what does that mean? That just means that light affliction that we have suffered is but for a moment. We have an eternal perspective. We have a kingdom of God perspective. Now, The book of Ephesians is really different than most of the other epistles in that it looks from what God has already done for us. We tend to go to God and say, God, please do this, please do that, right? But the truth is that God's already done it. So in Ephesians 2 and 6, it says this. It says, and raised up together and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ. So it's saying we need to understand who God has made us to be who we are in Christ, and what authority we have. We're seated together with him. But then in the fourth chapter, it says, Therefore, I, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the call. So first, we're seated and we find out who we are. Then we begin to use the authority that we have in Christ and to do the things that God has called us to do, and we begin to walk that out. But then in the fifth chapter, it says, For you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And in the sixth chapter, having done all to stand. Having done all to stand. And uh, I wanted to close with uh, a quote out of a book that Jeannie and I read just a couple months ago. All right, said, Paul said, when you've done everything you know to do, just stand. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to make things happen. You don't have to worry. Just stand in the face of opposition. Stand when every voice says it's not going to work out. Stand when the medical report is not changing. Stand when your finances aren't improving. Stand when your child is not making good decisions. Stand means you're not moved by what is not changing. You're not complaining because it's taken too long. You're not bitter because of a setback. You're not frustrated because your plans didn't work out. You are instead immovable, unshakable. You're rooted down deep. You have a report of victory when you could be complaining. You talk about health when you're fighting illness. You talk about abundance when there's poverty. You talk about overcoming when you feel overcome. That's what it means to stand. You stand believing trusting, you stand hoping, you stand expecting, and if you stand immovable and unshakable, you will be unstoppable. The winds of testing will not keep you from your destiny. They will launch you into your destiny. Having done all, stand.
Sometimes you've done everything you do and it doesn't seem to have mattered. But you know what you do? You stand. You keep standing. And you keep standing on God's word. And this is what Jesus said. You build your life on that word. When the storm is over, you will still be standing. Now, now, before we, before we close, if you're here today and you're standing and you say, it doesn't seem to be moving. And you want to make a statement. You want to make a statement to devils and demons in hell. You want to make a statement to the kingdom of God, that you're standing and you're not going to move, I want you to stand up right now. Stand up. I'm standing. Doesn't matter what it looks like. I'm standing on God's word. I believe that word. And Father, I thank you right now for every person who's standing. I pray, Father, that you will strengthen them by your spirit with spiritual might and strength in their inner man. And we say, Holy Spirit, come minister to them, strengthen them. And we thank you, Father. We agree with them for victory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You know, the Bible is God's word. It is God speaking to us. And we often say the Bible has the answers to all of life's questions, and it does have all the answers. But the Bible also has the greatest questions. Let me just give you a few of them. For example, the Bible asks this question, what is your life? Now, if I were to ask some people, what's your life? Somebody would say, well, my life's happy. Somebody else would say, my life's a wreck. Somebody would say, my life's my family. Somebody would say, well, my life is my job. Somebody might say, my life's going nowhere. But the Bible answers the question and says, your life is but a vapor that's here for a moment and it's gone. Uh, we live in the North Country. And in the winter, you go outside and you breathe and you can see your breath. It's a vapor. And in two, three seconds, it's gone. The Bible says in light of eternity, the time that you're going to spend here on this earth in this physical body that you're living in, it's just like a few seconds. It's just a vapor and it's gone. The next question the Bible asks is this, what will the end be? What will the end be? Now, by the way, it is multiple choice, but there's only two choices. The end, when your body wears out and dies, you're either going to spend an eternity with God we refer to that as heaven, or you're going to spend an eternity separated from God, which is referred to as hell. There are no other options. And then in the book of Acts, there's a man who's been a jailer, and he comes to the apostle Paul, and this is his question, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? You see, there is something you need to do, and it's receive what God has done for you. Jesus went to the cross, shed his blood, and paid for your sin. He died and rose again, victorious over death. And if you need forgiveness, and everyone does, Jesus is the only Savior. He paid for your sin. And the Bible says, to as many as receive him, to them he gives the right to be the children of God. Now, I want to pray with you to receive Jesus. If you don't know where you stand with God, you're away from God, I'm, gonna, I am, I'm begging you, pray this prayer from your heart and give Jesus your heart and life and receive him as your king and your savior. So I want you to make these words your own. Pray this prayer out loud. Say, oh God, I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins. And I believe he rose again. I, I give him all of my heart and all of my life. I hold nothing back. I receive Jesus as my King and my Lord, and I'm going to live for him. And I thank you. You've heard my prayer. I'm forgiven. My past is gone. I'm a part of your kingdom and your family today and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you just prayed that prayer, We have written a book especially to help you keep on growing in your spiritual life. Want to get it to you absolutely free. All the information is right there on your screen. And thank you so much for being with us today. God bless. If you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Dwayne, you are making one of the best decisions of your life. We are so excited for you. Just as Pastor said, we'd love to send you a free copy of his book, Your New Life. 
Log on to walkingbyfaith.tv and have a copy mailed to you. Download it instantly or check out our new audiobook. You can also find all these things on our app. This book is absolutely free and a great resource for you to have. Walking by Faith is changing lives on and off the air with the help of viewers like you. When you choose to sow into God's kingdom, He will pour out His blessings upon you just like it says in Malachi 3.10. If you'd like to become a partner with us, we have three easy ways you can give. One, text WBF Give to 1 888 364 Give. Two, visit walkingbyfaith.tv slash give. Or three, click on the giving icon in our app. We would love to connect with you. When you scan this QR code, you can download our app, send us a prayer request, check out our weekly devotional, and most importantly, stay connected. If you're looking to rewatch today's episode with closed captions, you can now find us on Rumble. We pray this message helps you tap into God's power and you stand up against the things trying to hold you down. Be blessed. We'll see you next week.